Welcome to video one for week nine. At the end of week eight, we defined the notion of multivariable functions, which I usually will call scalar fields. In this video, we want to start developing the calculus of those functions, and we'll start with limits. I'm going to start with the formal definition, and then we'll go on to interpretation and calculation. So the formal definition is very, very similar to the single variable limit. The only difference now is that we have a whole vector of, of directions to approach. So we're now dealing with a domain that is in Rn. We have a function that depends on n variables. So instead of just approaching x approaching some value, we have a vector x1 x up to xn approaching some value a1 up to an. So this statement that the function has a limit as we approach a certain point in Rn means for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta such that the if the input is within delta, so if the input is very close, then the output is within epsilon. The output is also very close. These epsilons and deltas were our way in previous courses to define the notion of closeness that was present in the informal definition of the limit. We want to be a certain closeness between the output and the limit. We have to start with a certain closeness of the input. And if we're close in the input, then we're close in the output is the definition of what a limit is. Getting closer and closer here means getting closer and closer in the output. So in that sense, there's no difference other than the fact that we have vectors uh, instead of scalars for the input. Limits in single variable functions define continuity. The same thing is here. A function is continuous at a point. A point is now a point in Rn, not a point on the real number line, if the limit approaching this point is the same as the function value. We have a nice result here that we can actually check continuity in each variable. So if f is individually continuous in each variable, we sort of pretend that only the first variable counts and then only the second variable counts. Then if we have continuity in all of the variables individually, we actually have continuity in this more general sense as well. That means that we can make use of a lot of our single variable results about continuity. Elementary functions are continuous on their domains, so the conventional functions we have, polynomials, trig exponentials, expressed in multiple variables, are still going to be continuous where they're defined. Discontinuity is still mostly going to be an issue of special types of functions, piecewise functions, these kind of things. This is really nice since we don't need to do that much new conceptual work with the idea of continuity. So let me talk about limits. One of the big challenges of limits is approach is now much more complicated. So this is a limit for a function that's defined on R2. So we have x, y approaching zero. When we approached on the real number line, if we approached zero before, we could approach from the left and we could approach from the right. Now we have the origin in R2. We can actually approach from infinitely many directions. And we can even approach on all sorts of different paths. We could approach in these lines, we could approach in a spiral path that goes in towards the origin. So this makes the calculation and the evaluation of limits actually quite a bit trickier. We can't just look at the limit from the left and the limit from the right. We have to look at the limit from all possible directions. That said, if there are algebraic techniques that give us the limit, they still work because those algebraic techniques will apply regardless of direction. So let's look at this limit. This is a limit which is type 0 over 0, both the denominator, numerator and denominator approach 0. Limits of type 0 over 0, I'm going to try and use algebra if I can. I can factor the numerator as a difference of squares, and then I can cancel these off. And that gives me a limit which is no longer type 0 over 0, a limit which I can just evaluate. It turns out that this limit is in fact 0. This type of algebraic technique, which we were pretty familiar with for single variable limits, still works. If there's some algebra we can do to simplify the expression and get a limit that we can just straightforwardly evaluate, that still works. That covers all the possibilities of direction of approach, because this calculation doesn't change depending on which direction you approach. This calculation holds for all possible directions of approach. Here's another slightly more complicated calculation. Same thing, we have x, y approaching a certain point, so now I'm approaching 4, 1 in R2, and again I can approach from all sorts of directions, but I can still do algebra. This is a limit of type 0 over 0. Here I've got square roots in the denominator, so I'm going to multiply by a conjugate. Um, I have to multiply numerator and denominator by the same conjugate so that I preserve the fraction. So in the denominator I get the middle terms disappearing, positive and negative, 
And so I get the first term square root of x squared is x, the second term 2 root y squared is going to be 4y. Then I can do a little bit more factoring by factoring a y out of this term, and I see that I get similar terms that I can cancel off there, leaving only y and this conjugate term. And now I've gotten rid of the problematic denominator, now I can just evaluate. So I evaluate at x equals 4 and y equals 1, so this x becomes 4, this y becomes 1, this y becomes 1, and evaluate that, I get a limit of 4. So the algebra is a little more complicated than the first example, but it still works. And anytime there are algebraic techniques like this, we are free to use them. They will still give us reliable results. However, I want to show you some examples where things don't work as nice. So here we have a limit of type 0 over 0. And there's not obviously any algebra for me to do here that's going to simplify this. And in fact, I'm going to pr prove that this limit doesn't exist by dealing with the, the issue of approach from multiple directions. So here we're again, we're approaching the origin in R2. So I can approach from multiple directions. One way I can think about that is I can approach from lines. So let me look at the equation of a line, y equals mx, a line with slope m, and say, well, what if I approach along a certain line with that slope along a certain line with this slope? By choosing different values of m, I can approach on different lines. But if I approach on one of these lines, then I can use this equation. I can actually replace y. These y's here can be replaced with mx. And then instead of just ha having x and y go to 0, I can only have x going to 0 because now x is the only variable. So by restricting the direction or type of approach, I can actually turn limits in two variables back into limits in one variable and then work with them and see what happens. I expand this numerator. Um, this denominator is as it is, and then I have x squareds here, I have x squareds here, so I can factor them out. Uh, x squared there, x squared there. This numerator is going to give me 1 plus 2m plus m squared. That's the same thing as 1 plus m squared, so I've, after I factor that x out, um, let me just write this, this numerator is 1 plus 2m plus m squared, which is equal to 1 plus m squared, so that's where I got this term. The denominator of factor the x squared out, it just gets 1 plus m with the squared inside the brackets. The x's cancel off, and then since the x's cancel off, there are no more variables, I can just evaluate this limit. I get this expression. All right, so let me recap. I chose a direction of approach, and I got this expression as my limit. Now what happens if I make my slope explicit? What happens if I approach on a slope from line, uh, a line of slope 1? Well, then m is equal to 1. If I put m equal to 1 in this expression, I get that the limit is going to be 2. So if I sort of redraw this diagram up here, if I approach on the line of slope 1, I get a limit of 2. But what happens if I approach on a steeper line, a line of slope 2? Well, then if I put 2 in for m here, I get 9 fifths, which is different. And if I put different values for m, I've got sort of infinitely many slopes I can choose, they're almost all going to be different when I put m to the expression. I'm not going to get the same expression here. What this tells me is that this original function, this limit depends on the direction of approach. And I'm going to get different values for the limit depending on which direction I approach it. That means the limit cannot exist. If the limit existed, it would be the same regardless of what direction I approached, by proving that the limit depends on the direction of approach, I prove that the limit fails. And this is one of the most common ways to prove that multivariable limits fail by choosing certain directions of approach. Let me do another example of doing this. So here's another multivariable limit in R2 approaching the origin. Here I'm going to approach, instead of along straight lines, along parabolic lines. So I'm going to approach along x equals my squared. So depending where m is positive, I can approach along certain parabolic lines. If m is negative, I'm going to approach along different parabolic lines. I'm going to look sort of like this. And I can approach along any paths I want, so parabolic paths are perfectly reasonable. This lets me replace x with my squared, and as, x goes to, as y goes to 0, then x is going to go to 0. So this lets me turn this into a single variable limit by replacing x this way and I get these limits, and these limits are going to tell me what this does approaching along these parabolic paths. Again, I have y to the 4 in all of these terms, so I can factor y to the 4 out, 
cancel it off, I have no more y's left, so I can evaluate the limit. And it turns out this limit depends upon the parameter of this parabolic path. If the parameter is zero, that means approaching along a straight line, then the limit is zero. If the parameter is one, that means approaching along a certain parabola, then the limit is three halves. And already I can stop because I can prove here that my limit already depends on which parabolic path I approach on. And if the limit depends on the direction of approach or the path of approach, that means the limit cannot exist.